and yeah. patent it and have you make it work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start up today with exercise 205, and uh, the truth is that for 205 and 206, it's a lot about me giving you certain skills in Rhino. And so the object that we're going to make is far from exciting, um, but it is very much about kind of fine scale detail about how we're going to work with an object that's not quite rectangular anymore, so we're moving out. Today will be surfaces, planes, but they'll be slightly on an angle. Uh, we're going to work with chamfering surfaces and then actually trimming off certain pieces of surfaces and kind of how to work through corners and that sort of thing. Next class, we'll deal with tubes and pipes and those kinds of, uh, you know, objects. And so you, as much as these kinds of things are less than exciting, I have to do these sorts of things very scripted to get you a certain set of skills. Uh, once you have that set of skills, then we can start to, to, to explore and, and let you have more creativity and freedom on your own. Um, but until you have those set of skills, we have to find a way to give you those skills. Um, and so you guys, you just have to kind of bear with it. And if you feel like it's going really easily and, and you want to embellish or, or tweak things or something, sure, just make sure you get the basic understandings of what I'm trying to teach uh, down so that when it gets later on in the road, you're not stuck with, oh, I can only build a, a box-like object because that's all I, I really know how to make. Um, so. Last class, we did V-Ray. Uh, today, we're not going to do V-Ray specifically, though at the end, I'll ask you to go ahead and throw a material on and do a rendering to get an output. Um, so we will do a little bit as repetition to practice with the V-Ray realm, uh, but it's not going to be all about V-Ray. We'll do a couple of these, then we'll move into V-Ray, and we'll do some more V-Ray, then we'll come back, and we'll do a little bit more, uh, et cetera. So we'll, we'll continue going back and forth. So once again, I'm going to start with a large object inches as my default template. Um, and that's what I'm going to begin my work in. Um, I've given you a few instructions on kind of how this goes, including um, a kind of a detailed little drawing of one side of this piece that we're going to make, uh, which obviously as I go to, to, to make it will make more sense. A um, couple things to note, the measurements are in inches, um, so that you can, you can use those uh, to, to kind of generate your object. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start um, with point zero zero, and I'm going to draw in the top view to begin with. So kind of like we did when we were doing the building elevations and the building floor plans, it was easiest to draw in the top view first, uh, and then rotate it up into the third dimension, uh, though it's not required that you do it that way. It just seems to be a little bit easier. So I'm going to start with the polyline tool right here. And I'm going to start on the drawing. There's a little tiny arrow. Uh, online, it's colored in red, I think. But for, for you guys, it's in, in gray on the copy. It's in that little corner. That's where I'm going to start at point zero zero, And I'm going to start drawing from there. OK? So I'll start at point zero zero. So I'll type in 0, comma 0, followed by Enter as the start. So I start right there at the origin. And I'm going to work my way around this object. And it doesn't matter which direction I go in. Um, but if I, if I start this direction, that's fine. The other thing that I will show you is I'm going to model this all the way through as a whole object, but then I'm going to show you how I personally would model it and how it can be a lot faster if you model it that way. Um, so I'll end up modeling it twice, but we'll, we'll start with this. OK, so I'm going to start by going over 48 inches. So again, this is a direction, right? 48 inches in that direction. And then I'll click. Now I'm going to go up by 36 inches in this direction. So there I am at 36 inches. Now I'm going to come over at 4 inches, like that. Now, on this piece, as I come down the side, the side tips out by 2 inches. Okay? So here's a perfect opportunity. Thus far, we've always done length and direction. Right? That's usually the fastest. But remember back to that second lecture, 202, where I talked about the coordinate system and being able to use relative coordinates? Here's a perfect example of a use of relative coordinates as I'm drawing. Right? Because I don't know the length of this line anymore because it's on an angle, I do know the place that it should end up, which is at, right, in the x direction, 2 inches. So at 2 inches, comma, right, negative 36 inches, because I'm going down inches. And I'll end up with that diagonal line tipped out on one side. OK? How far over need to go? 2 inches. So in the x direction, it's 2 inches. Oh, oh at the top, it's 4 inches. So I went over 48, up 36, over 4 inches. And then at that point, 
I went over 2 inches and down 36 inches. Okay, so i just like to point this out. Are there other ways of doing it? Sure. Could I have drawn it uh, where I did like a little line and then I went over and then I drew the line in between? Sure. Right? But if, if you get used to how these coordinates work in your head, a lot of times it's much faster to be able to quickly type in a relative coordinate. So the at sign uh, followed by the coordinates. But now I can go right back. So this time it's going to be 6 inches and I'll go 6 inches straight down. Okay. Again, I reach this point where using a relative coordinate would again be a good idea. So this time I'll use the at sign again for relative coordinate and I'm going to go over negative 30 inches and comma and then down another 6 inches so it would be negative 6 inches. And so now I've gone down to that point. Okay? Now I can use the at sign again and this time we're going to go again negative 30 inches but this time we're going to go up 6 inches, 6 inches. And I'm back there to the start. So using that at sign followed by the relative coordinates is very, very helpful on a shape like this. Right? Uh, and I'll show you how to do it without. It's just so many more steps and so many more clicks. So if you can get used to this relative coordinate thing, it'll make your life a lot easier. So we'll go ahead and go 6 inches up. There I am in that direction. At 2 inches over, comma, uh, it's positive. 36 inches this time. There it is. We'll go over 4 inches in that direction and I'll type C for close to create a closed polyline. Okay. If I didn't do it that way, right, and I started over here and I started drawing, right, I'll start in the same place, 48 inches there, 36 inches here, Oops. in that direction, 4 inches there. Okay, now I get to this point. It's like, okay, well, I could go down 36 inches there, and I could go over 2 inches there, and then I could draw a line that goes from here to here. But this line is connected to that, so let me explode it, and then let me go through, and I'll pick this, and I'll pick this, and I'll get rid of it. Okay, so that's the same, but you saw how many extra steps it was instead of just typing at minus, or at 2 comma minus 36, right? So, as you learn this, it can make your life a lot easier. So I just wanted to point out that it is, of course, doable without using those uh, relative coordinates. But in the case that you need the, uh, to do it, uh, you know, it's a lot faster to do it with the relative coordinates. Okay, so I have this shape that I've worked through. And again, I'm not expecting that you will be able to completely follow along with me and build it. Some of you will, but a lot of you won't. Just watch me go through it, and then you'll work, kind of work your way through the details, and I'll come around and help you. Um, that's the nature of the class. It's impossible for you to follow everything that I do step by step, or we'd be sitting here with me waiting for everybody to catch up, and it would be an extraordinarily boring class. So I'm going to switch now into the perspective view, now that I can see this in the kind of the third dimension. And I'm going to use my rotate 3D command. So I've made it to step two of part one. And I'm going to go up to transform rotate 3D, or I could type rotate 3D. It's going to say select objects to rotate. I'm going to select my objects here. I'll hit enter. Then it says start of rotation axis. And so remember, as we did last time, the rotation axis is the line around which I want to rotate my objects. So the line around which I want to rotate my objects is right along here. So I'll click here as my first point. I'll click here as my second point. And then I'll set my first reference point being out there. And then because my ortho is on, I can fold it so that it's straight up into the third dimension. Right? So I pop it up into the third dimension like that. And I now have this object, and I'm ready to start working with it in 3D. Okay? So it's still just a polyline. No actual surfaces exist just yet. Okay? So I'm going to continue working with this. Now I'm going to use the offset command, which you've already done before. Uh, and so it's under curve offset, offset curve, or again I could actually type offset, or I think offset is a tool somewhere, but I never pick it, so it's probably here somewhere, right? Uh, so I'll go ahead and select curve to offset or distance. So I want to check distance first, and the distance, do I specify what the distance is? It's probably four feet, but I don't know where, oh, four feet, yep, four feet, all right? And it's going to say select curve to offset. Okay? So I'll go ahead and pick it. 
Now notice that in this context, right, it's predicting that the offset that I'm going to make right, is going to want to go backwards or forwards from this object, not out to the side. So if I wanted to offset this object, I don't, but if I wanted to offset in 3D, here's my object, right, something like that. If I wanted to offset it the way that I'm doing it, right, I'll get a second copy that's out here. You get the idea, right? But if I wanted instead to have an object that went out in the same plane, kind of like we did with the walls that went out this way, it's not going to let me do it in this perspective view. Right? So this is a little bit advanced, but if I switched into, say, right, the front view, it would let me do it. Do you see how the offset changes depending on which view I'm in? So for what we're doing, we just want to be in the perspective view, and that's just fine. All right, so I'll go ahead and offset in that direction, and I end up with two lines that are exactly four feet apart. Okay? So under step four, I ask you to do an explode. And the truth is that the explode will cause you to repeat the loft command, but it's unnecessary. Um, so I'm actually not going to do the explode. And I think you guys are all sophisticated enough to be able to handle a loft of, of two poly surfaces or polylines. So I'm going to skip step four. And on step five, right, I'm going to select the two, co the two curves, so here and here. And I'm going to hold down shift when I do it. So there's one, there's two. They're both in yellow. And I'm going to come up to surface and then loft, or I'll simply type loft. And when I do that, it's going to say drag scene point to adjust, press enter when done. And the reason that it's giving me the drag scene point is because these are two closed poly surfaces. Okay? So if I want to create a set of uh, two closed poly curves, sorry. If I want to create a set of surfaces that could follow along, I want to make sure that these two points start at the same point on each curve. So right now, they each start at that corner, right, what was my original 0, 0 point, uh, and the little arrows go in the same direction. So I'm happy. And I can go ahead and press Enter, and it's going to build a set of surfaces that go around my object. Let me go ahead and view this for a second in shaded mode so that you can see it. Okay. So it took these and it went around my object and built those surfaces all the way around. Okay? If I had exploded these two curves instead, oops, if I were to explode these, I would pick two opposite curves, say there and there, and then I would go to surface and then lock. And I'll say OK. And so, Likewise, I could go to these next two, surface, and loft. So you can see this obviously would take a lot longer to go all the way around my object. Okay? It's extra steps, but I have a lot of fine control over which curves are actually lofting to which curves. If, <coughs> let me take these two curves again. Again, I'm showing you different examples to help teach you about the loft command. Um, oops, hold on a second. Okay. Let me go back to where I had these two, and I went to loft, surface, and then loft. Okay, there's my seams again. If my seam started at a different point, let's say it started like that, when I went and did the loft, right, it would be connecting or lofting. Right? See, there's that seam that I started. It would be lofting this line to that line. Does that make sense? So I'd end up with a shape that looks exactly not what I was trying to create. Okay? So where the seam happens is really, really important for what the overall shape of this object looks like. Okay? So I want to make sure the seams end up in the same place. And if they do, I'll end up with a nice, clean poly surface that goes all the way around. Okay? So I've gone ahead and I've done that. All right. And so now we get to the two ends on either end here. And so ultimately what I'm going to do is I'm going to chamfer the surfaces together so that we have kind of beveled corners. Right? Now a large part of what you're going to do today is be working with those chamfered surfaces and how do you trim them and make them look clean. Okay? 
So I'm going to work on the edges of these quite a lot. Now, one of the things that's really important when I do that is I need surfaces to have edges that match each other. And so, for example, if I were to create a surface from three or four corner points, and I went here, one, two, three, and four. Oops, made a mistake. Try that one more time. One, two, three, and four. And I were to look at these, this edge right here corresponds to the edge of this surface right there. See how they're one to one? Okay. Likewise, this edge that slopes down matches up perfectly because there's a new surface down here. Okay. If I didn't do it this way, and I instead did a surface that went, say, something like that, right? I'd have two surfaces that are trying to match up with one surface. No good. So when we're establishing these on the ends, we want to make sure that our surfaces match. So I can do the surface from three or four corner points there, and that matches up nicely. Okay? Now, if I look down here at this shape at the bottom, okay, I have a bit of a problem. Because I need a, a, a line, ah, I've screwed this one up again, hold on. Okay, I need an edge that falls right here, and I also need an edge that falls down here. So if I did, say, one, two, three, and then this point down here is four, right? That could potentially work, because I end up with an edge that's along here and an edge that's along here. That would work out fine. But I can also just finish at three, because I really only need that edge. So I'll finish at the third point. So that edge matches this edge. So we're pretty happy. Okay. Now I can do the same thing on the other side. I could go like this, there, and there, and finish. And I could go here, two, three, and four. And that would get me that triangle and that triangle. Now at the end here, right, I end up with an object or surface that would be made up of five points. Right, because I have one line across the top here, and then I have a line that's here and a line that's here. So instead of being able to use this surface from three or four corner points, I need to be able to patch a surface or a set of curves. So I'll draw on here a set of curves that go around this particular object. Type C to close it. I'll select that set of curves right there, and then I can go to surface and then patch two by two, and I'll say OK. And now I have a surface at the end here that matches up very nicely. Right? One line is right there, one line is right there, and one line is right there. So I'm pretty happy. Yeah? That's exactly where I'm going with it. I'm, I'm, breaking, I'm working my way up to it. Okay? No, it's OK. It's a great question. So that was a lot of work to divide up the surface. I can, in all likelihood, do it by using the curve itself that goes all the way around and then doing a patch of that curve. And so we're going to double check and make sure it works. So from here, we'll go up to uh, surface and then patch. And I'll say OK. And I get one solid surface that goes all the way around. Now we're going to try this and see. It may not work because it might break right here. Right? They may consider this one continuous curve instead of two. So we'll see. Okay? So now I'm going to move on into the chamfer surface. So let me go ahead and go up um, to my uh, surface, and I'm going to go to, uh, hold on a second, I've got to find it, chamfer surfaces. Okay. Select first surface to chamfer or distances. So by default, it's set to 1 and 1. That's a pretty big chamfer. We're going to set it to a half by a half. So I'll do 0.5 and 0.5. And now I'll come in here to my first surface, and I'm going to pick this surface and then that surface. And you'll see that it clips the corner of my little surface right like that. Okay? I'm going to take this a step farther, and I'm going to repeat the chamfer. So once again, surface, chamfer surface. And I'm going to go from here to there, right? and it's going to clip the corner. So there's our problem. So it did decide to treat it as one continuous surface uh, rather than two. 
So if we flip over to the back side here, from where I divided this up into more pieces, this is going to work better. So let's repeat the chamfer, and we'll do the same thing up at the top. We get the clip. Okay. Now as I go down the side, we do those two, and it clips, and it ends right here, which is where I wanted it to. We'll repeat there and there, and we get a nice seam right there at the joint, and we can continue following through. Okay. As we continue on here, it gets a little bit more complicated. So we'll go from there to there, and we get that. Now notice that these don't quite line up correctly. We're going to have to fix that a little bit later. All right, so we'll continue working our way around. We'll go there and there. And again, we've got a little bit of a problem right there. We'll go from here to here, from here to here. By the way, I'm right-clicking to repeat the chamfer command. And I'll keep working my way around. All right, I've done that. Now, I'm going to ignore this piece, though I could do it, but it adds a lot of complexity right here at the joint. Okay, So for right now, I'm just going to ignore it. Okay, so <coughs> in the interest of not making you watch me do the whole thing, I'm not going to worry about the back side just yet. I'm going to worry just about the front side. Okay, so let's look closely. Oh, let me do these top edges. So I'm going to chamfer these two together, and I'll chamfer these two together like that. Right. Likewise, I'll chamfer this, and I'll chamfer that. All right, so if I zoom in on this particular object, we can see right, that I have a, a surface that overlaps up here. I have a surface that overlaps right there. And I don't really have a clean corner. Okay? I'd like to create a clean corner so that I don't have all this mess. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the polyline tool. And I'm going to draw a polyline, basically a triangle, that goes from right here, that point, to right there, that point, and back down to right here and then back across like that. Now that I have this little triangle that kind of clips off the corner, I can use that as a trim. So I'll type trim or go to edit trim, and then I can get rid of extra pieces of this surface like that until I end up with a nice clean kind of corner. Okay? So you notice as I'm trying to, to orbit around the object that it keeps going out of my view. This is going to be something that's going to happen to you. You're trying to work on something, you zoom in on it, and then all of a sudden you try to rotate it, and you're like, wait, where did it go? Right? It can be really annoying. So there's a trick to this. So I'm done with the, the, the trim command for right now. And that is that I can use a special zoom command that will refocus your whole world around a particular object. And it's called zoom to object. So I'm going to type Z for zoom, right? and then I'm going to type S for selected, okay? because I have that little triangle selected. Once I've done that, my whole life revolves around that one little triangle. Right? So it suddenly makes it very, very easy to orbit around and see every facet of this triangle. Okay? If, however, I zoom out and I zoom into this side and I try to orbit, it's reasonably close, but it's not quite as accurate. Okay? So I'm going to have to do this zoom to, to object many more times as we go forward. So once again, I'll use a polyline, and I'll go from here to there to that corner there and then back, so it's a closed polyline. I'll select my curve, I'll type trim, and we'll get rid of these extra pieces that are sticking out here. And part of the reason that this exercise is particularly good is you have to learn how to see the objects in 3D. So for me, it's pretty easy to pick out which objects need to be trimmed because I'm used to seeing this in 3D. But for you guys, you may need to orbit around a little bit more to see, uh, you know, am I in fact doing what I want to do or trimming what I want to trim. OK, so there it is, clipped off in the corner. I'll hit Enter to finish the command. Now, I still have these triangles that are actually open. See, I can see inside the, the shape here. I can close them off with a, a surface from three or four corner points, like this, one, two, and three. Hit Enter. Or I could select that curve that I created, and I could go to Patch, Surface, and then Patch. And I'd essentially get the exact same thing at the end. Right? Doesn't make a difference which way you choose to do it. They'll render the same. They'll look the same uh, in the long term. Okay? So these upper corners are really a matter of, of creating that little triangle and doing the trim. Okay? When we move down on the object, right, this corner looks pretty darn good to begin with. But if we go to this, this corner down here, 
right? And again, here's an, here's an example where my zoom isn't quite working correctly. So I'd like to recenter it on a particular object. Uh, if I went to draw a triangle, say from there to there, I could technically draw it back to this corner and back to there. And I could use that to patch and throw a surface in there. And it would technically be filled. Let me recenter on this, zoom selected. But if I were looking at it in 3D, you see how it kind of pops out to the side? It's not really that clean. So herein lies a challenge. Okay, and part of the reason I picked this object in the first place is because there's a lot of these issues that happen. And uh, we have two things that are important to talk about. One is the fact that this extends out a little tiny bit important when we're looking at the object as a whole. Can you see that little piece that's sticking out? No. Right? So it's important to recognize what is the scale of your object and how, how close are you going to render this object. Okay? So the fact that that little piece is unresolved really doesn't matter in the long run. Okay? However, for the, for the scope of trying to actually work with this class and, and figure out what's going on, we're going to deal with editing that particular point. Okay? So once again, I'll zoom selected so that I can zoom in on this point. I didn't like this triangle, so let's get rid of it altogether and let's get rid of that curve. And now, how are we going to adjust this? So we have two different ways of kind of uh, adjusting or dealing with this object. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through what the, what the strategies are. The simplest way, using the tools that you know how to do use already, right, is to draw a polyline from this point to that point. And instead of trying to find a triangle here, we can go all the way down to the point where they intersect right there and the point where they intersect right there. And then we can come back up to here. And we've essentially drawn right, a curve that goes all the way along here. And we can use that, for example, as a patch right, to, to create a new surface. So I can delete this surface altogether. Right, and I can use this curve here. And I can go to Surface, Patch. It'll fill in a little surface. I can use that as a trim, and I can trim off this extra little piece there. Right? And so I now have a nice little surface that goes all the way along there. Um, if I look carefully, yeah, we're in good shape. Okay? So that was one way of doing it. I just drew where I wanted the surface. The truth is that it's not a flat surface. It's actually skewed a little bit. But again, how close are we going to do the rendering? Can we really tell? No. Okay? So if I didn't want to do that, the way I personally would go about doing it is I would actually make some modifications to this surface instead of creating a new surface. And I can do that by doing two things to it. The first thing is that the, the line has already been trimmed off here. So I'm going to use a command called untrim, which is the opposite of trim. It says, give me back my full surface. So I'll use untrim. And again, this is the more, op the, the more advanced way of doing it. And I want to untrim that edge. So it gives me the full size of that edge untrimmed. Okay. I'll hit Enter to finish. Then I'm going to turn what are called edit points on. So I'll click on my points on, oops, there it is, of this surface. Oh, come on. There it is. And you see that I get that little tiny point on one corner. Okay. I can then move that little point from there to right there. And I've essentially modified that whole surface by closing that one little point. And then I can use this surface to trim, exactly as I did on the other, the other piece. I can trim off, whoops, it helps if I can type, trim of this surface there, and that goes away. Okay. If I come down here to the end, I still have a problem because I need to trim off that little triangle. I can use this surface as a trim, and I can get rid of that little triangle like that. And I have it coming to a nice little point there. Okay. Don't be um, thrown off because of this line, this UV line, is off center. It still is a nice closed object. Okay. It can just mentally it can throw you off a little bit. Okay. So I've gone ahead and I've done that and I've worked my way through the chamfer. As I come up to this little point, I have a tiny little hole that's right there in the edge. I said I wasn't going to worry about this bottom. Um, so I'll go ahead and just patch that in with a surface from three or four corner points like that. 
I'll hit enter, now I have a little surface that's there. So I've worked my way around this side of the object, right, to create a finished set. And if I came over here, I could keep going, I could fix the top, etc. Okay? So now I told you that there was there would there was a way that I would model this that would save a lot of steps. Okay? So I want to show you that strategy just so you can see kind of how I would how I would uh, go about it. Okay? So I'd start again with my polyline, very much the same way that I've been doing. Right? I wouldn't start in the same point. Um, I'd actually start by drawing just half of this shape. So I'd start in the center and I'd go over um, 24 like this. I'd go up 36. I'd go over 4. I'd go at negative 2, negative 36. Like that. I'd go down 6. And then I'd go at uh, 30 comma negative 6 and I'd end right there okay so I end up with just this little half piece okay then I'll do a rotate 3d and I'd rotate this piece up into the third dimensions okay so you see I'm, I'm starting with just a little quarter of it or half of the front now let me offset this half the distance so I'll go to 24 instead just going back 24. Then I'd take these two and I'd loft them together. Give me that piece. Then I'd go through the same thing in the front here with my surfaces. So one, two, three, four. And then one, two, and three. And then here I go one, two, Three and four, and I end up with that. So you see how I basically have made just one corner of this. Then I go through with my chamfer. So I go to surface, chamfer surfaces. Or uh, personally, I would type chamfer surface because I never actually do this. Oops, surface, chamfer surface. Thank you. I, like I said, I don't pick it. So, okay. So let's do those two. Let's do. Those, do those, there, 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 and there. Right, right. And I'm right clicking to repeat the last command to save myself from having to go pick it. Okay, so now I have it set on just this one corner. I'll go in and I'll do my triangles again. So I'll go from there to there to there. I'll type C to close the triangle. And I will use that as my trim. We'll get rid of this and that, and that. There we go. I'll repeat on this side. There, there, there. C to close. Trim. There, oops, there, 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 like that. Once again, I have to patch this, so let's patch. Or I could use the surface from three or four corner points. It, it really doesn't matter. Okay, so I end up with those fixed. I still have to fix down here at that corner. Same problem. So as, as I did, I would untrim there, and then I would... I type points on, and I'm going to move this from there to there, and then we'll trim off that little bit of excess like that. Okay, so I've just gone through. Oh, I need that one little, one little three-point surface there, there, and there. There it is. Okay, so I just went through, <coughs> and I modeled one side of the four instead of all four. I can then take this whole object, right, and I can mirror this direction, and I can take this whole object, and I can mirror in that direction. And that then saved me from having to do the other three corners. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So philosophically, that was easier. But for you guys just starting out, a lot of times it's easier to just build the object as a whole. But I'm trying to show you this way of thinking 
because when you're modeling in Rhino, the more efficient you are, the quicker you can actually model something, the more you can move on to doing something else with it. Okay? So uh, I'm going to have all of you start working on this um, and, and build this shape out, and I'll work with you to kind of sort out what's happening at these lower corners. Uh, in order of challenge, the upper corner is the first one. The lower corner here is the hardest one to deal with. Okay? And that's scripted on purpose. So you'll probably start with the upper corners as you work through. Once you're done, <coughs> you'll go ahead and click Save. We are going to do a render of this scene um, and apply a material. So for those of you that want me to, um, in about an hour and a half or so, after you've had plenty of time to model and, and play around with it, I'll come back and show you the render, show you how to set up the light and everything. You already have the skills to do the rendering, but I'll walk through it again just in case. Okay? But I don't want to hold everybody up and make you do it now because now you're concentrating on I want to model. Okay? So I'm going to turn you loose to do the modeling first. Are there any global questions? No? You guys know I always ask about global questions, not individual. There's a reason for that. OK, so we'll continue in a bit. OK, so I'm going to talk through kind of the basic rendering options um, in terms of getting your, your scene set up. Let me clean up my scene slightly. Uh, I'll leave these two objects in place um, as two rendered examples. Um, the first thing that I want to do is I want to reload that V-Ray toolbar that's missing. No surprise. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the uh, Tools menu, and I'll go to Toolbar Layout. I can choose Options or Toolbar Layout. The difference is Toolbar Layout takes me straight to the Toolbar set of the Options pane. If I say Options, I have to click on Toolbars to get there. Other than that, they're identical. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and go to File, and then Open. And on my flash drive, in my resources folder, um, I have the V-Ray toolbars. There they are. Go ahead and say OK. And now I'm going to set up the scene. So just like we did before, I'm going to go ahead and, and create a, a scene layer. Um, we'll call one of these infinite plane, if I can type. And we'll make one of these my directional light. And I can make one of these, call, I could call it scene. And just for organizational purposes, I could put those underneath the scene layer. Doesn't matter, but it's there. So let me start with infinite plane. I'll make that layer active by double clicking on it. And then I'm going to drop in a V-Ray infinite plane. It's available right here from the toolbar. I can click on it. It's also viz infinite plane is the uh, command line command for it. And so it drops in, which is great, <coughs> but it also drops in level with uh, the base of my little bridge here. So I have a couple options. I can select my object and move it up, or I can select my infinite plane and move it down. It doesn't matter which one. Um, so I'm just going to move the infinite plane down. Um, a lot of times it's easiest to do it in one of the side views. I can just click and drag it down below like that so it is below my object. Okay? I'm using the side views because if I tried to move it in this view, let's say I type move, and I said, OK, I'm going to move it down. Wait a minute, it's going to lock in. So if I needed to move it down, I'd have to go to Move. And we see that I have an option for Vertical, in which case I can then move it vertically. Okay? But again, it, it's how you do it doesn't matter so much. OK, so now I have the infinite plane in place. I still need that directional light, just as we did last class. So let me double click on the directional light layer. And I'll establish a quick little box. Same thing that I did last time. There it is. And I'll use my directional light that's conveniently hidden. And I'll go from that point to this point. And then I'll go ahead and delete my box. And there it is shining down on my objects. Okay. So at this point, if I were to render it, right, I'd have almost an entirely white scene because I haven't applied any materials yet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back up to my default layer. Make that active. That's what I drew on. Uh, I could actually rename this layer to be Bridge, for lack of something better. Uh, and then let's go ahead and lock the infinite plane and the directional light so I can't accidentally select them. And now it's going to be time to apply materials to these objects. So I'll select the whole object, go to the Material Editors, or the capital M. And I don't have concrete yet, so let me go ahead and right click on my scene materials and go to Load Material. And I'm going to go to my flash drive. 
and I have a resources folder, and I have V-Ray materials here, and I have a folder called concrete, and then I can pick any one of the, the concretes. And so I'm just going to do a basic concrete, uh, which is fine. And if I were to look at it, that looks like concrete. Perfect. So I can right click and say apply material to selection. I already have it selected. And I now have the material applied. Let's assign a different concrete to this piece just for fun. And it also repeats the steps. So I'll select the object, click on the M for the material editor. I'll right click on scene materials and go to load material. And instead of basic concrete, we'll pick a, uh, I don't know, let's do a rough board form for fun. And go ahead and say open. And then I'll right click on rough board form and say apply material to selection. And now I have it applied both to this object and that object. Okay. If I want to see a quick little preview of them, I remember I can switch from shaded mode to rendered mode. And I see kind of a preview of what my objects look like. Um, it's not too bad, right? Like the board form object, we can see that I have the board forms on the side here, right? I've got some problems because I mirrored the object, so the textures mirror, right? Um, I can fix that, it's not a problem. Uh, I also have a problem because the, the texture goes up and down at the bottom instead of going sideways. Um, so that's something that ultimately I'd like to fix. This object, however, right, uh, looks a little bit better. Okay, as I look at it, looks looks pretty decent. Um, the only problem is that the scales on the sides aren't quite right, um, which is can be a little bit problematic. So this is as far as you need to go, other than we need to actually create the rendering for you to post. So I click on the R to create the rendering. I get my little view with my um, my rendered objects here. Okay, that's all I need for posting. However, there's enough of you that have said, wait a minute, I, I don't like having my, my texture patterns do this. Right? I'm going to show you how to change it, though this is really jumping ahead because in about three lectures is when we'll cover it. Um, what this is is it has something to do with texture mapping, um, which is the topic we'll cover in depth. And it has to do with how is a material applied to a particular surface and what's the direction of it. Um, the easiest way to change it for right now is we're going to select the whole object like that. We're going to click on Properties, and then there's three options. Object, which is what we're used to seeing. Material, which is what's the material. And the last one is called Texture Mapping. And that controls how the, the material applies to the surface as a whole. So if I were to click on Texture Mapping, and remember, this is completely optional. You don't have to do it for today. We'll cover it in more depth a little bit later on. Uh, when I click on that, you see that I have the ability to select one of the presets here. The only one that I'm going to talk about today is the box mapping, which basically says this object looks kind of like a box, which is what we're after. So I'll say, yes, this looks kind of like a box, and I'll click on it. At that point, I need to look up here at my command line, and it says first corner of base, or do I just want the bounding box? Okay, I'm fine with the bounding box for right now. I'm also fine with world, which is the default. But this is a capped object. Again, it's the default. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And once I've done that, if we look at my object, we see that this now goes all the way across. It's not mirrored anymore, right? And furthermore, it follows all the way down and continues, right, as I get to the edge. It didn't turn and go the opposite direction anymore. Likewise, it's hard to see, but across one of these corners, the texture wraps around the corner and continues along this way. This one wraps around the corner and continues that way. So it makes this look better in its final rendering, if I were to render it, than it did before because all the t textures are the same scale and they go the correct direction. Okay? There are a lot of options that are available relating to the texture mapping of an individual object. You will spend a lot of time working on this, but it's premature for you to spend too much time today. Uh, the only reason I'm showing you this is I've had enough questions from people saying, wait a minute, I want to change it, so I'm pointing it out. Again, completely optional. You don't have to deal with it at all uh, for today's post. Okay? Once you've created your object and once you've been able to make your post, or once you've been able to make your rendering, go ahead and save your object and then post this JPEG to the course website by the end of class today. Okay? Should be an, a reasonably close up so we can see that there has been materials applied and that the edges have been kind of clipped off. Okay? 
Do also save your work for this file. We will use this file again um, later on. So make sure you do file, save, and save the .3dm Rhino file. Um, so this is exercise 205. And I'll go ahead and make sure that I save that so that I can use it down the road. Okay? So I'll go ahead and continue coming around and helping you with things. I just wanted to show the, the process of getting the final rendering out. Again, remember, the texture mapping is completely optional. If you get a material on there and it doesn't look right and you just render it, I'm happy. Right? That's the victory today. Uh, but if you want to take it a step further, uh, I at least wanted to show you that for those of you that are feeling um, adventurous.